Well, good evening. We are glad that you have chosen to join us for this time of Bible study. We've been going through the Psalms, and uh, tonight, uh, one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 22. It's a uh, favorite for a lot of reasons. Um, it's, it's a hard Psalm to deal with. Um, not because of the psalm itself, but because it is so picturesque of the crucifixion of Christ. You, uh, you read this psalm, and if you're familiar with the New Testament, especially <clears throat> the crucifixion of Christ, you really have a t uh, difficulty remembering that uh, the psalmist was not actually looking at the Lord Jesus as he was being crucified on the cross, and uh, you kind of struggle at that point, uh, for, you know, remembering that the psalmist was actually going through some kind of difficulty in and of himself, and uh, uh, it's, it's easy just to think that he's looking ahead and, and not struggling in and of, you know, having his own personal struggles. Um, but I believe that the psalmist was dealing with his own personal issues, had his own personal struggles. And I think he has a lot to teach us, especially in these days of the coronavirus. Uh, but one of the things I want you to be aware of, we're going to take two weeks and look at the psalm. I hope that I will get through uh, Psalm 22 tonight. And then next week we can sort of talk about an issue uh, that I want to deal with. Actually, there are three things that we have to at least focus on. Number one is the, uh, the psalmist in and of himself and the struggle that he is dealing with. Secondly, uh, his view and how the Bible actually used this psalm. I forget how many different references there are in the New Testament to this particular psalm. Uh, there's six or eight or something like that. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, the number one is this, the psalmist himself and the struggles he's dealing with. Number two uh, is how this psalm is played out in the New Testament, showing us, uh, you know, just the picture of Christ and the suffering that he himself endured. But thirdly, uh, I believe that this psalm really was used by Jesus as a parable, and I'll talk more about that next week. Uh, I need to go ahead and tell you. <laughs> I don't even know if I need to confess this tonight or what, but uh, I need to go ahead and tell you that uh, I really find myself on some very thin ice when I began talking about this being a parable of Jesus. Not a lot of people agree with me, uh, but I... I really believe it. I have believed it for many, many years. And so next week, we're going to look at how I believe Jesus used this psalm as a parable uh, to teach uh, the religious people of his day uh, the wonderful truth about the gospel and how we need to identify with that. Uh, as we begin tonight, I want us to begin with a time of prayer. We have many people that uh, are in the need of prayer, and we want to lift them up. And uh, I would encourage you just to pray for those that are on your heart during these days, and uh, just pray, believing uh, that God has some great things in store for all of us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege we have as believers to call and cry out to you. This psalm is going to teach us about how to pray and how to pray believing and how to keep on believing even though things don't always look like or turn out like uh, we think they should. I pray that you'll teach us more about praying and how to pray believing that you love us and you care for us. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to study the psalm and especially this psalm tonight, I pray that you'll just speak to our hearts, especially in these days as we continue to trudge through uh, these difficult waters of the pandemic. 
I just pray that you'd bless every individual that will be a part of this Bible study, regardless of when, regardless of where they may be. I pray that you'll help us to continue to pray, even through these very difficult days. And I just pray now your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Psalm 22. The psalmist begins, uh, well, first of all, he, uh, he tells us that this psalm is for the director of music. He even gives us the tune, and I have no idea uh, what the tune would have been, but he actually tells him the music that would have been played as this song was being sung to the tune of the doe of the morning. And then he tells us it's a psalm of David. Now, many of the scholars struggle with it being a psalm of David because we don't know that David ever had a moment when he was suffering uh, as we find in this psalm. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a psalm of David. It may have just been a period of his life that the scholars cannot find, can't place the time of this psalm. Interestingly enough, there are those who say that Jeremiah may have written this psalm or that Hezekiah may have written this psalm. And tonight, as we study, uh, I'm going to make a couple of references to Hezekiah. That's not because I identify Hezekiah. I don't have enough knowledge to make that identification or that connection. Uh, but one thing that I did find interesting was that uh, Esther may have been the one who wrote this psalm. Now, there's not a great deal of support for Esther, uh, but with all that she went through in becoming king, becoming queen, uh, this could have been easily uh, attributed to her. But here again, there's not a whole lot of support for that. I just found that very interesting. One of the things that the psalmist is doing is he's crying out to God. But God doesn't seem to be at home. It's as though God has left the lights on, but he's not answering the door. And so the psalmist begins with those wonderful words that we attribute to the Lord Jesus on the cross, and that's where the connection of this psalm and the crucifixion of Christ comes. The psalmist begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out day and night, but you do not answer by night, and I am not silent. There is a desperate cry out to God, but God seems not to be there. So now the question arises, why? Why is God not there? Uh, not, not that bad things happen. Bad things happen all the time. But this psalmist is really wanting to know not why bad things are happening, but why is it that God seems to be so far from his cry, his plea for deliver deliverance? Notice that he keeps crying out to God day and night. But God remi remains silent. Just yesterday, I was a part of a Bible study and we were studying Experiencing God, and there was a section in which Henry Blackaby dealt with the silence of God, and he talked about those times when he himself had gone through periods of silence. Not knowing why, he began asking his friends, and they told him it was because of sin in his life, and if he had just confessed his sins, uh, God would no longer be silent. And then Blackaby said that's exactly what Job's friends had said to Job. Now, if there is sin in your life, by all means, you need to confess that sin. But you need to remember that the silence of God does not always mean that uh, sin is in your life. Sin is not the only reason that God sometimes remains silent. The psalmist never gives us a reason for the silence of God, but rather he cries out to God. He asks him why he's not listening, why he's not answering, but rather than dwell there, 
he immediately kind of turns and he begins to praise God, not for what God is doing now, but he begins to look back into the past and remember his heritage of faith. And I encourage you, hang on to those words. Heritage of faith. Notice what he says in verse 3. You are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. Uh, scholars tell us that ba basically what we find in verse number uh, 3, verse number 3, is that you are holy and you are sitting enthroned among the praises of your people Israel. The psalmist has been raised in a nation where the praise of God was the heritage of the people. And even though he himself at this moment feels forsaken of God, it's silent as he turns to God, There's, it seems as though no one is listening. In the silence that is there, he remembers all those times where his people would cry out and praise to God. Verse 4 continues, In you our fathers put their trust, they trusted, and you delivered them. They cried, they cried out to you, and they were saved. They trusted in you, and they were not disappointed. The psalmist is reminding himself of his heritage. And because of his heritage, he, it gives him confidence even in these times when God remains silent. The longer your history of trusting God, the more assurance or the more confidence you should have that God has delivered in the past. Has. It's past tense, but it's the past tense that gives him confidence or assurance even today. And it gives him confidence and it should give us confidence even now. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, a lot of people read that and they think, Well, I can't give thanks in all circumstances. Well, you can. If you have a heritage, if you have a history of walking with God and God has brought you through then even when you don't know what's going to happen next, like right now with this pandemic, this coronavirus, it's, it's changing every day. And everything we're hearing about it seems to be changing every day. How do we thank God every day? Because we don't know what's going to happen next. Well, we thank Him today because he's seen us through, through so many difficult times. And because he's brought us through those times, we should have the confidence to thank him even today. In desperate times, you need to remember, and make note of this, it's going to happen. In desperate times, wicked people will mock your faith. And that's exactly what the psalmist is dealing with in this passage. But I'm a worm, not a man. I'm lowly. Look how low I am, God. And then he begins to talk about how he's scorned by men. He's despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults at me and they shake their heads. It's just everything about them, their insults, even the way they carry themselves seem to mock uh, the psalmist. He trusts in God, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now, if you're familiar with the uh, gospel story, especially the crucifixion, you know those words were actually given to us in the gospel at the crucifixion of the Lord. It's as though the psalmist is looking ahead and a lot of people see this just as a prophecy, uh, a, pro a, a psalm of prophecy uh, where the psalmist is just looking ahead and he really has no struggles in and of himself. 
But we know, even though we don't know when this psalmist uh, suffered, and this psalm is attributed to David, scholars really have no time when they can look back in David's life and say, oh, this psalm is talking about that. But if you remember, uh, and here again, this is one of the, my references to Hezekiah, not that I'm attaching this psalm to Hezekiah, but if you remember from Sunday's message, and if you don't remember, I would encourage you to go back and look at that psalm. Uh, Hezekiah himself was being threatened by the Assyrian army. And Hezekiah cries out to God. But the people that the Assyrians had sent to Jerusalem to threaten them, they are mocking the, uh, them. They're, they're telling Hezekiah, don't you put your trust in God. And they're telling the people, don't let Hezekiah cause you uh, to trust in God. Matter of fact, the general, 2 Kings 18, verse 19, the field commander said to Hezekiah, look, where are you going to put your trust? On what are you depending to save you from us? And, and he even says down in verse 22, if you say we're depending on the Lord our God, that's foolishness. He begins to list all the nations that had gods. They trounced them, and their gods weren't able to stop them. What makes you think your God is going to? 2 Kings 18, verse 30, uh, the, the general just announces to the people of Israel, don't let Hezekiah talk you into trusting in your God. Your God can't stop this. And so we see that any time we're facing uh, tremendous situations, uh, devastating times, there will be those that will mock us and will mock our faith. Don't you turn to your God. He can't save you. Verse number nine, he continues <laughs> with confidence in God. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast upon you. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Now, this psalmist is expressing the idea here that ever since I have been a part of this world, trusting you has been my heritage. And I cannot stress to you enough how important it is that we bring up our children in the worship of God, in the praise of God, and teach them to praise God. Not only teach them with the words that come from our mouth, but teach them in the life that we live. I said Sunday, uh, this coronavirus, it's a something that we need to exercise tremendous caution uh, as we live in these days. It is something for us to be concerned about. This is very real. We need to be cautious, but we don't need to panic. We need to develop a confidence, a trust in God. And that's exactly what this psalm has said. Look, I have always been a part of the heritage of people that trust you, even from my mother's womb. From the day I was born, I've been a part of people who put their trust in you. The Hebrew word here is actually a phrase that sort of gives God the glory for giving him Life. If you remember the psalmist, the psalmist uh, talks about how God has knit him together in his mother's womb. And uh, we just need to realize God made us and God is going to sustain, sustain us and see us through. Uh, verse number 11, do not be far from me for trouble is near and there is no one to help. God was then and he is now our only source of hope. If you remember the story from Sunday morning as Hezekiah was talking uh, to God about the people of Assyria, 
One of the things he said in 2 Kings 19, verse 18, they, the, the Assyrians have overthrown all these nations. They did destroy all their gods, but they weren't really gods at all. But you are God. Let me say it again. The longer you have been a believer, the greater your trust, the greater your confidence in God during difficult times. The psalmist has been a believer all of his life. He has a heritage of being with the people of God. And God has seen them through. I realize not everyone listening uh, to this Bible study has been a believer all of their life. Some of you will say, well, I've only been a believer for a week. or I've only been a believer for a month or maybe a year. But 10 years from now, your testimony should be, I have been a believer and I have been growing in my faith for 10 years in one week, for 10 years in one month or 11 years or whatever. Put your confidence in God. Put your trust in God and let your faith in God grow. Grow from this day forward. You need to be a stronger believer next week than you were this week. And the more you walk with God, the more he'll give you reason to put your trust in him. Now notice if you would, he's back to metaphorical language. In other words, he's describing his enemies with all kind of imagery. Verse number 12, he says, many bulls. <laughs> There's not bulls surrounding him, but he's just talking about the strength of these people Bulls were very strong animals. These are strong people that are mocking him. And he says, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan. If you have a history of reading the Old Testament, you'll know that the land of Bashan was a great cattle-raising uh, part of the country. When the children of Israel got ready to cross over uh, Jordan, and go into the promised land, there were some who wanted to stay in the land of Bashan. They didn't want to leave that fertile land for grazing cows. They wanted to stay there and raise strong cows. <laughs> Later, we find where uh, Amos talks about the cows of Bashan, and he's talking about the, the ladies in the church. They, you know, they're living fine, luxurious life, and they got hungry, starving folks right at the door of the church. And uh, Amos calls the ladies of the church fat cows of Bashan. You know, you're fat and sassy and you got starving people right at your door. It's not a compliment, but it's because they're living a life of luxury. The land of Bashan was a land of luxury for cows. And so he calls them strong bulls of Bashan. Verse 13, he refers to them not as bulls, but as lions, roaring lions, tearing their prey, opening their mouths wide against me. Verse number 14, he comes back to talking about himself. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a posture, and my mouth, Sticks, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust of death. Now here again, those are words. If you know the story of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll recognize those words as the exact words that were used to describe a part of the crucifixion scene. It doesn't mean that the psalmist was not suffering, but it certainly is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back to the imagery of using language in verse number 16, he goes back to using metaphorical language. Verse 16, he refers to them as dogs. You know how terrifying a dog can be, especially if you don't know if you can be rescued from the dogs. Dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil men. See, he's talking about men, even using the language of bulls, of lions, of 
dogs. He's talking about evil men. Evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Verse number 18 is actually a verse that is referred to. At the crucifixion of Jesus, they, cast, they divided his garments. They cast lots for his clothing. It's as though the psalmist is looking at the crucifixion of Jesus. Doesn't mean it wasn't happening in his life, but it really is a, a scene in the life of Jesus. Finally, he turns his attention. He's talked about them. He talked about himself. He's talked about them. And now he's going to turn our attention back to God. And basically what he is doing by turning our attention back to God, and please get this, the psalmist is praying, even though it seems as though God is silent, because he has a heritage of being among people that have prayed. He knows he can pray to God, even though it seems as though God is silent. He has confidence that he can keep praying. And we must keep praying. Jesus said that we are to pray and not grow weary. We pray until God answers. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Keep praying. Verse 19, but you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of these dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Here again, he's using those three images, the bulls and the lions, the dogs, and he's praying that God would deliver him. There's no one else we can turn to. God is our only source. So we keep praying, and we keep praying with confidence that God is going to see us through. Now, one of the things that happens in this psalm, and by the way, this is the reason I believe this was used as a parable by the Lord Jesus is because this psalm turns. If we attribute this psalm just to the crucifixion of Jesus and we don't acknowledge this turn, I think we've lost something very valuable. And I'll talk more about this next week. But this psalmist turns at this point and the whole tenor of the psalm changes. One of the reasons I keep saying we need to be a believing, belonging, committed uh, group of people uh, is exactly what this psalmist is trying to get us to do. Believe and keep on believing. Believe in prayer and keep on praying. But not only believe, but belong. One of the reasons this psalmist has such confidence is because of the heritage that is his. I cannot stress to you enough, if you have been a believer for any length of time, someone is watching you. Someone is paying attention to everything that you do. And they're encouraged by you, or they're going to give up on their faith because of you. It is so important that we, we realize we belong to each other. We have a responsibility to teach the next generation about praising and declaring the things of God. Verse 22, the turn of this passage. I will declare your name to my brothers. Notice he's not just asking God, where are you? Why are you silent? Now he's praising God and he's saying, I'll be a witness. I'm going to declare your name to my brothers in the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or disdained. He's grown silent. Yes, I don't see him. Yes, I don't hear him. 
but he has not cast us off. Our heritage reminds us that he has seen us through before and he'll see us through again. He has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of our praise, the great in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. He will give us something to praise him for. May your, may your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and will turn to the Lord. We can be a witness of God. Even in these days when it seems like we don't know what's going to happen next, our confidence in God should leave a legacy for the next generation. We have a heritage that we need to make sure lasts into the next generation. All the ends of the earth will remember and they will turn to the Lord and all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nation. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn because he has done it. We have so much to praise our God for. I know in the days of this pandemic, this coronavirus, it's extremely difficult to find reasons to praise God. But don't let the silence of God be a reason for you to turn somewhere else and begin looking for answers somewhere else. Continue to pray and continue to pray and pray with confidence Pray with assurance that because of what our God has done for us, he will continue to bless us on into the future. I pray that generations on down the road will look back at our generation in the midst of this pandemic and they will say there was a people that taught me to praise God even in the midst of difficult times. Thank you for being a part of this Bible study. I pray that somehow God will use these words to encourage your heart. Let me pray with you as we close. Father, thank you for this psalm, and uh, I just pray that you'll use these words to encourage our hearts. Help us to be stronger believers, maybe not because of what you're doing right now, but because of what you've done in the past. We know you're going to see us through these difficult days. Father, thank you for your many blessings. Go with us each day from this day forward. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.